Hey everybody, Sportsegrity is finally back and we have a loaded show of sports to talk today. The Super Bowl just got wrapped up, college basketball madness is running wild here in February. We have the Olympics going on at weird times, but they're still going. We have the All-Star Weekend coming up and on top of all that, the NFL offseason has officially begun and... Now we all have to find different ways to spend our time on Sundays. So uh, with all of that, I'm ready to get right into it. My name is Chad O'Shea, and I'm ready to talk some sports. So let's get started. So let's start this off with the biggest story in sports here on a Monday as I'm recording this. The Rams, Bengals, Super Bowl, and it was a pretty good game. Uh, wasn't the most exciting game in the world. A couple big plays here and there, uh, but it very much was a... Uh, scrappy football game. Nothing that the casual fan would really find too exciting. Um, but Rams win it 23 to 20. And I got to say, I'm very impressed with the Bengals and how they performed, uh, especially when you look at how mismatched they were up front with the Bengals offensive line and the Rams defensive line. Uh, so for most of the game, they were able to adjust. They were able to call some plays to get their playmakers the ball. Uh, T. Higgins with two touchdowns and Jamar Chase got loose a few times. But in the end, it was the Rams that really pulled through and their age and experience really made the difference. You know, late in the game, it was really just Stafford and Cooper Cup just driving right down the field. And that's a connection that's been deadly all season. It's been deadly all throughout the playoffs. And it's the reason why Cooper Cup is the Offensive Player of the Year. He just had an insane year for a receiver, and he really deserves that championship. And the Rams overall really deserve that championship. You look at the players that they have on that roster. You have Matthew Stafford, who was trapped in Detroit for years and seemed like he was going to retire there without many accomplishments. Then he gets traded to the Rams and... They win a Super Bowl, so he really worked out to be that magic missing piece. Um, and then on top of that, you look on the defensive side of the ball. You have Aaron Donald, who has this great career but was missing that ring. You have Jalen Ramsey, who's been one of the top corners for a few years in the NFL. He gets his ring. You have Andrew Whitworth, who's 40-some years old on the offensive line, who just won the Walter Payton Man of the Year. He has all these accomplishments but never won a ring. And then he goes and wins one against his former franchise in the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and then you have Vaughn Miller, who, you know, also was in a kind of lower market franchise with Denver, and he goes in and wins the Super Bowl after joining the Rams. And then on top of all that, you have Odell Beckham, who just joined in the second half of the season, um, and he got hurt in the Super Bowl. And, you know, he ended up, you know, news came out today that he tore his ACL, and you hate to see that in the Super Bowl. He did catch a touchdown, so he definitely made his contribution, and he deserves that credit for that championship as much as any other Rams player. Um, but, you know, as much as I wanted the Bengals to win, you have to respect all the players on the Rams roster and just how dominant that team became as the season, uh, as the season uh, went on. But even on the Bengals side of things, they easily could have won this game. Uh, you know, late in the game, that last drive, down by three, the final couple minutes, Joe Burrow driving down the field, you get to a third and one near midfield. And I don't like their play calling. You know, it's third and one, and you run the ball with P. Ryan, your backup running back, right to Aaron Donald, who is a game wrecker. Especially in that fourth quarter, he was really picking up steam, and he just took over from there. He made that stop on third and one, or at least was in that kind of area of that stop on third and one. And then on fourth down, he gets right through, pressures Burrow for a bad pass. It's incomplete. Rams win it. So I think the Bengals could have done a better job with play calling late in the game, but that's history. As of right now, the Rams are your Super Bowl champs. And you look in the Bengals side, very young roster, a lot of potential. They'll be back in the Super Bowl. Uh, they do have a major issue up front with that offensive line. I think they're going to take a very similar approach to what the Chiefs did last year after getting demolished up front, um, except they're in a much better situation. They don't have a Mahomes that has a half a billion dollar contract that really limits what they can do on their roster. They have Joe Burrow who just finished up his second year of his rookie contract. So they have three more seasons of a rookie contract with Joe Burrow, which gives them so much flexibility to go out there, spend money in free agency, draft a piece or two for the offensive line, and really just get back to this big game next year with a bunch of improvement up front. And obviously their defense has a little bit of holes here and there, um, but I'd say overall, especially throughout the playoff stretch and throughout the season, the defense has played pretty well. So um, you know, the Bengals are not far off. They'll be back in this game, um, and we can all root for Joe Burrow um, and just the crazy personality and the great story that he's become. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk some college basketball, my favorite area of sports. And this last week, 
was one of the most insane weeks of upsets and madness that I've seen in the regular season of college basketball in a long time. You go down the list, and I'm about to list them all off, but you know there was too many upsets in the top 25 teams this last week in college basketball, and it really is just an, uh, a good preview of what March is going to look like this year in March Madness, and I am fully excited for it. I already just want to fill up brackets and get right into it, but let's just go down the list. You know, you started last Monday, and you have uh, Duke at home against Virginia. They lose last second to a game-winning bucket to Virginia. So Duke got things kicked off with that shocking, shocking upset loss. Then a couple hours later on that Monday night, Kansas goes to Texas, and they drop a game against Texas in a close one. So you had Kansas and Duke. They get upset Monday night. So then the next night, Tuesday night, you have number one team in the nation, Auburn. They lose to Arkansas, unranked. But Auburn has been on a huge win streak, a huge run, and they are really fighting their way back into a pretty good spot in the tournament. So you have Kansas, Duke, Auburn. Are you following so far? So far? Um, there's a lot more to that. Um, you go to what else happened on Tuesday. You had teams like 18 Marquette. 22 St. Mary's. Um, those teams all fell on Tuesday. So it was kind of the, the bottom half of the top 25, but those are still important because as we're going to go in this week, you're going to keep counting these upsets and you're going to keep seeing. So then you go to the next day, to Wednesday. Number six, Houston. They drop a game to SMU um, on ranked. That's going to be the theme here. Uh, and then you have Texas Tech on that Wednesday night. They lose to Oklahoma. You guessed it, they're unranked. Then you had 16, number 16, um, they lose to Rutgers. Um, I didn't put in my notes who 16 is, so I forgot uh, which team exactly that was. Um, but uh, Rutgers, I believe that was Ohio State that was at 16. Um, I'll double check that. But regardless, it was one of three unranked teams that Rutgers beat last week. So uh, Rutgers is red hot, despite how embarrassing their season has kind of been. Um, and then you also had Xavier. Number 25, they lost to unranked Seton Hall. So all that was crazy, and you're probably thinking, you know, there couldn't be that many more upsets. I mean, surely there's a lot of great teams in college basketball. Nope. Very next night, Thursday night, unranked Michigan goes and beats number three, Purdue. So there you go. Are you following along? You got number one that lost, number three that lost. Um, so you know, those alone are a pretty big week of upsets. And then over the weekend, you had Houston lose again. Marquette lost again, and you have UCLA that also got upset. So it's all madness, and I'm here for all of it. There's a few other upsets beyond what I just listed there, but hopefully you kind of get an idea. Um, college basketball is crazy. That's why I love it so much. It's really my favorite sport um, is college basketball, and we're just a month out. <laughs> just a month out. Can't even talk. I'm so excited. Uh, just a month out from March Madness, so um, I am ready for it. I'm ready for those brackets to come out. I'm ready to watch these conference tournaments. And it's that time of year, and it is going to be really awesome just seeing these upsets and seeing it all come to fruition. Next up, we go to the NBA. And the big story uh, over the weekend is LeBron James becoming the NBA's all-time leading scorer, including playoffs. So the reason I add including playoffs is it's kind of weird with sports where all these all-time scorers, all-time yards, all-time touchdown, all these different stats, the all-time doesn't ma doesn't really factor in playoffs. And I think it's kind of a weird scenario because playoffs are what you play the game for. It's what matters most. And so I think it should be carried with a lot of weight. But LeBron James passed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the all-time leader in points, including playoffs. Um, as far as the regular season mark, which is the one that they kind of track the most and kind of you know, make a bigger deal out of. He's about, I want to say about 1,800 some points away from passing him. So it'll take another season for him to beat that mark at some point next year. But even if he, if LeBron plays the next couple seasons, he's going to absolutely shatter those marks. And that's just crazy to me. Uh, you know, I followed LeBron my, his whole career, you know, since he came into league in 2003. Um, and, you know, the last few years, you know, there's been some things I disagree with him about, and um, he's been kind of outspoken a little bit more and more here. Um, but we don't talk about that on this uh, on this uh, channel. We keep it positive. So um, with LeBron, you know, it's just great to see 
how much he's grown over his career. And the crazy thing is he's putting up numbers this season when he's in his late 30s that he was putting up in high school and, you know, when he first came into the league. There has been no downward trend in his game at all, and he still looks as if he's a rookie out there. So all credit, all respect to LeBron James as he's the all-time leading scorer, including playoffs, but, you know, give it a year or two and he'll be, you know, for sure the all-time leading scorer regular season and playoffs, all of that. It's, there's going to be no doubt he's one of the best players of all time, and uh, I won't get into the conversation of if he's the, the greatest of all time or not, um, but he is definitely on that Mount Rushmore of NBA legends. And now let's, let's rewind back to the NFL because we now that the Super Bowl is done, all of the head coaching vacancies are all filled. The Vikings were the last domino to fall. They hired Kevin O'Connell, the offensive coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams. So uh, there's really two main head coaching hires that I think are going to have the most potential for success and um, that are in the best position to succeed right away. So let's start with the Vikings because that's my first team. And I'm a little bit biased uh, with my Minnesota Homer uh, brain, you know, uh, showing out here. But with Minnesota, I think O'Connell comes into a great position. Now, you don't factor in any of the money. You just look at the roster on offense. You have Kirk Cousins, who has a lot of similarities to Matt Stafford in L.A. You have Dalvin Cook, who's better than all the running backs that the Rams have. You have Justin Jefferson, who's on the same level as Cooper Cup. And then you have Adam Thielen, who is, uh, I'd say at this point in their careers, about the same level as Odell Beckham, kind of give or take. And then, uh, you know, you add in all of that. This is a Vikings offense that is very similarly built to the Rams offense that just won a Super Bowl. Now, obviously, the Vikings defense, not even in comparison, not even close to the Rams defense. So that plays a factor. So I'm not saying they're going to go out and win the Super Bowl this year. Um, but, you know, the Vikings do have some major questions, mainly with Kirk Cousins' contract. Do you want to commit to him beyond this year? But it's going to take some either restructuring or you just have to trade him. Um, now, I think Kirk... He, he might be willing to restructure without a fully guaranteed contract because you have a new head coach that comes in that he's familiar with from his time in Washington. He's an offensive-minded guy. He's going to be a lot more creative with the play calling than what we've seen in Minnesota under Zimmer and the rotation of offensive coordinators that have come in and out of the building uh, really in the last decade or so of the Vikings franchise. But I think the big issue with Kirk is – I really think there's a personal aspect to it where he wanted so much guaranteed money because you have Coach Zimmer who did not want Kirk Cousins, and it's pretty obvious. Um, and then you had Rick Spielman who fully wanted Kirk Cousins. And since that Kirk Cousins signing, that kind of caused uh, the breakdown of the relationship between head coach and GM in Minnesota. And every year after that, it just progressively got worse and worse to the point where uh, this last season you had you know Mike Zimmer, the head coach, and Rick Spielman, the GM, who just didn't talk to each other. And uh, that's a big reason why they're not here anymore in Minnesota. So I think that Kirk, now that he's playing for a coach that would probably want him, uh, he might be willing to do a much more team-friendly deal. Uh, but even beyond that, Vikings have some questions to answer on defense to free up some cap space with aging veterans and big contracts and a young defensive star in Daniil Hunter who just got extended last year, but he has only played in a handful of games the last couple of seasons. So... There's a lot of work to do on Minnesota, but I think just at that core offense and the playmakers you have to work with, O'Connell has a lot of potential to succeed right away out the gate. And the second big hire is kind of the obvious one a lot of people talk about is Nathaniel Hackett in Denver with the Broncos. So Hackett coming over from Green Bay, their offensive coordinator, I think he's really going to push. I mean, everyone thinks that it. it's not any secret or anything, but uh, Hackett's really going to push to uh, bring Aaron Rodgers to Green Bay or to Denver um, and with that being said, I think, you know, that instantly makes them a title contender. There's no doubt about it. The Broncos have all of the young weapons on offense, you know, at running back, receiver, even a decent offensive line. And then they have the defense to back it up and, you know, get them off the field. Um, but even without the Rodgers factor, you look at Hackett and where he's been previously, most notably, it was just a few years ago, the Jacksonville Jaguars were a few minutes away from a Super Bowl appearance and beating Tom Brady. And who was their quarterback? Blake Bortles. Who was their offensive coordinator? Nathaniel Hackett. Uh, so he's done more with Blake Bortles than any coach has twice or three times over in the NFL. And when you take a guy like that, it, it doesn't matter how historically great their defense was. You need an offense to back it up. You need an offense to put up points. And he was doing that with Blake Bortles at quarterback. So 
Um, I think Hackett is going to have a lot of potential to have a good year this year. Even without Rodgers, they can still fight for a playoff spot and really uh, make a good first year for the new coach Hackett. And now let's completely shift gears. We're going to talk about the Winter Olympics. Um, and we're not going to talk too much about it because, to be honest with you, I haven't followed it too much, um, at least live anyway. Um, I see I see United States is uh, third in the medal count, so we're right up there where we usually are. Go America. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really hard to cover that and talk about it because I feel like if I'm recording a video or if I'm following it, like, by the time that uploads, everything changes um, because you have all these events are happening either late at night or early in the morning for the most part. So um, there's really not a lot of time to react before the next events happen. And to be honest, I'm not very fluent in a lot of the, you know, specialty sports that are going on. So um, I'm just going to let them handle that. We're all going to watch it. We're all going to, you know, find those little interesting sports that we like to follow. So I'll probably wrap it up, you know, once the event's all done and we find out all the countries that are on top, things like that. But um, it's just way too hard to follow the Olympics. So uh, don't be expecting me to give any expert analysis on that anytime soon. But now, what am I looking forward to the most uh, this next week? And there's not too much going on, but there's a couple main things I'm keeping my eye on. Number one, it's still college basketball. Every week from here on out, there's lots of great things, great upsets that are going to happen. And there's a few matchups that kind of stand out to me as some ones that you want to keep an eye out on if you are starting to think about March and just start to follow college basketball a little bit closely here. Uh, first is just with Duke and Wake Forest. So Duke now ranked number nine. They are still in the top 10 despite that upset last week. But you have Wake Forest coming in. Uh, they have a record of 20 and six, 10 and five in the ACC. So not too far behind Duke. Um, and there really weren't too many huge wins on Wake Forest's resume, but you know they can't be too careful after dropping, Duke can't be too careful that is, after dropping a game, game at home against Virginia last week. So I think that was kind of a, a big knock to them. And I think this game is going to go one or two ways. I think Wake Forest will come out and surprise Duke, or Duke is just going to absolutely make no doubt about it. They're going to shut them out. They're going to enforce their dominance, and they're going to really you know, learn from last week. Um, but this is definitely not a game that Duke should take lightly um, and would not surprise me if they falter again. Now next up is number 20, Texas, taking on Oklahoma in Oklahoma. And the thing with Texas, so Texas has the number one defense in the whole country, least points allowed per game. Uh, so they are very good on that side of the ball. And they have some playmakers on offense too. The thing with them, they are only good at home. When they're on the road, they're two and six. So with Texas, you really have to keep an eye on, you know, is, is this a time of year where they can fix that problem, where they can play well on the road? Because I can tell you right now, once we get into the conference tournaments, the national tournament, Texas isn't going to have any home games. So uh, they got to figure it out. They got to figure out how to win away from their home court. Um, because right now, when they've been on the road, it's been ugly and they don't really have a lot to show for it. So um, it's impressive that they're still ranked 20 despite all those struggles. But, you know, whenever they're on the road, definitely they're a good candidate to get upset until they figure out, you know, what exactly they can do to find some consistency when they're not in their home arena. Next up is one that I'm really excited for, number 10 Villanova, number 8 Providence. So we have two top 10 teams taking on each other in the Big East. Um, and the thing with these teams is this is their first meeting. So they'll meet this week and then they'll take on each other to end the season um, in the beginning of March. So um, this is really a matchup between two teams that have kind of muscled their way uh, into the top 10 and are inching a little bit closer towards uh, really solidifying a spot in you know, maybe a two seed or a three seed in that March tournament. Um, and for a team like Villanova, you can always kind of count on them to be in that area when the national tournament comes around because they have that experience on their side. But look at Providence. Uh, they're having a really good year. Um, and they're ranked eight now. A win over Villanova, that's really going to help them uh, boost their resume. And Providence is just having a really great season. Only two losses on the whole year. One conference loss. Um, and really a handful of ranked wins on their resume as well. So, you know, like I said, these teams will face each other again this season, but the winner here is really going to pick up a lot of good momentum, not only within their conference, um, but also as we get into March, as far as seeding purposes, this game has a, 
a lot to determine on that side of things. And another one to keep an eye on is number four, Kentucky, heading to the heading on the road to take on number 16, Tennessee. I don't necessarily think Kentucky's in danger of a blowout here. Uh, they faced each other uh, when Kentucky was at home a few weeks ago, and they absolutely blew out Tennessee. I think it was 107-79, something like that. Um, but, you know, it's a road game. It's SEC, and so you can't take Tennessee lightly. Um, but Kentucky, with a win here, is really going to put themselves in a good position to, you know, knock on the door of one of those one seeds. And, you know, when you have Kentucky as a one seed, um, I'm still kind of on the shelf if I think they're a real title contender or not. Um, but anytime Calipari is in that one or two spot, you can really count on Kentucky to uh, make a run. So uh, we'll see how that game goes. But uh, Kentucky has really climbed their way up. You know, ever since that blowout win to Kansas on the road in Allen Fieldhouse a couple weeks ago, that's really turned a lot of heads and made people think this Kentucky team can be for real. And the last matchup I'm looking at is kind of a little wild card. So we got Illinois ranked number 12, and you got unranked Rutgers. So I talked about earlier, Rutgers, I believe, three straight wins against ranked teams in the Big Ten. And granted, those ranked teams they beat are a little up and down. They're not exactly huge title contenders. But anytime you have a win streak against ranked opponents like that, especially all within a week or so, uh, Rutgers is starting to turn some heads. They're starting to climb into that bubble conversation uh, to work their way into the tournament in March. Um, so a win against Illinois this week would uh, really give them a lot of good votes to start climbing into that top 25 conversation. Um, you know, even if they split this week, I think they're still, you know, going to prove a little bit more that that first half of the season, they're a different team. You know, they have some very embarrassing losses early in the year. So uh, this is a big one for Rutgers and um, definitely putting Illinois on upset alert uh, given the last week or so that Rutgers has had. And the other main thing that I'm looking at this week is All-Star Weekend. Um, not anything too important. It's just more fun to watch as a basketball fan. Um, it's not like you have to get too serious and analytical about it because, you know, players don't really take it that seriously. Um, but uh, as far as the All-Star game, if I had to make an MVP prediction for that Kobe Bryant MVP trophy that they unveiled this year, I'm going to go different. I'm going to say a big man's going to win it, and I'm going to say Joel Embiid. Um, you know, Embiid's definitely in a better mood. And now that Ben Simmons has finally gone from Philadelphia and he has a nice new teammate in James Harden. So I'm going to go ahead and say Joel Embiid is going to win an MVP uh, just because I feel like it. And I'm also kind of interested in the Rising Stars game in the new format. So instead of just one big two-team matchup, it's a four-team tournament for the Rising Stars game on Friday. Um, so you have four teams um, made of uh, six rising stars in the league and also one G League player on every team. So a chance for kind of an unproven player who's having a good season in the developmental G League to come up um, on the big stage, maybe make a name for themselves and, you know, maybe get a chance for with a team um, later on in the second half of the season. Um, but with the four team format, so the first two games uh, of those four teams, they'll go to 50. And then whoever gets to 50 first out of those two games then they'll meet each other, and then they'll play to 25. So um, I do kind of like that tournament format where, you know, it's not a long game that's drawn out, um, and the players are actually going to be playing to kind of race to 50, and they're going to actually care about the shots they take a little bit more. Um, you're still going to see a lot of that kind of all-star aspect where players try to show out a little bit. But I think it's going to be a pretty fun thing to watch, and I'll give it a watch where, you know, usually in the past I don't really pay too much attention to the Rising Stars game. But with Anthony Edwards in the game and a couple Timberwolves players there, um, there's finally reason for me to watch again. So um, we'll definitely be checking that out. And then on Saturday night for All-Star, that's usually my favorite night, mainly for the dunk contest, but the skills challenges and three-point contests are a little bit fun to watch too. Skills challenge is a little weird this year. you got Team Rooks versus Team Cavs for the home city of Cleveland. And then you got Team Antetokounmpo. So you have Giannis and his brothers um, on their own skills challenge team. So I think probably just a one-off thing just to have those brothers on a team. But, um, you know, with that skills competition, you know, nothing too crazy to work about there. Um, with a three-point contest, you don't have Steph Curry, you don't have Klay Thompson, and some of those mainstays that you see often in the three-point contest. Um, so Trey Young is probably the best shooter in that this year, and that's who I'm going to pick to win, Trey Young for the three-point title. And then for the dunk contest, if I'm being honest, it's it it's always been my favorite element of All Star Weekend. You know, even growing up. Um, but every year, it just seems like more and more it's it's stuff you've seen before. There's a lack of creativity, and you know, it's just not as exciting as it used to be. Um, so I think Obi Toppin 
is probably the only returner and the guy that's been in it before out of those four competitors this year. So I'll go with him and say that he's going to win this year. But with all that, that's going to wrap up everything that I have here today. Uh, so lots of cool things happening in this last week in sports. Lots, lots to look forward in this next week. Um, and, you know, I definitely am, for one, you know, really enjoying this time of year where March Madness is heating up and we're getting closer to that point. Uh, you have the second half of the NBA season coming up. Um, and hopefully with the MLB and all those other things, they pick up a little bit more. Um, but, you know, it's definitely an exciting time of year for sports as we transition in the NFL offseason and all those things. So um, definitely stay tuned for the next episode next week here of the Sportsegrity Review. Um, and thanks for tuning in today. My name has been Chad O'Shea, and now go out and enjoy your sports.